Okay, so in this video, I would like to demonstrate how to perform follow-up work on a newly discovered asteroid. So this is a near-Earth asteroid, and this is just an example. This object has already been confirmed, but hopefully this video will show you what steps to take in solving a uh, recently discovered object and confirming it. So. This is 2019 CS, and so let's get started. The basic steps here, uh, I like to run express mode, and what that does is it essentially helps to automate the process and reduce the amount of steps you have to do manually. So, so these are tasks that pretty much always have to be done. So calibration, alignment, and plate solving. And for some people, you might also have to do normalization, and so I'll explain that here in just a bit. So calibration is where if you have a dark frame, you can supply it. If you have a flat frame, you can also provide that. In this example, we have neither of those, and we're actually going to use what's called a pseudo flat. So this is where the software is going to manipulate the pixel values such that they all have a relatively consistent value, uh, have a consistent background value, if you will. So that makes the image flat, so to speak. And in this case, 5,000 is the ADU count uh, for the background value, as what I've specified. These are all values that are discussed in more detail in the user manual, and here they are very good defaults, so you can almost always use these. But you can also fine-tune it for your own data set as well. Okay, so that's calibration. Alignment, in this version of Tycho, you can use one of two programs to facilitate alignment. Registrar or PixInsight, and I will go over the merits of those two in another video as to why you might choose one over the other, but for now I will use PixInsight. And normalization, so if you did not use the pseudoplat, then uh, you would want to use normalization so that you achieve consistent background level from one frame to the next, essentially, because the pseudoplat is going to not just achieve a flat image, but it's going to do that for each image in the same fashion. So it, it ensures that each frame has a consistent background level. And that's relatively important uh, for the tracker to operate optimally. But since we did specify pseudo flat here, then we don't need to perform normalization. The last step is plate solving, and this is where you're able to map pixel coordinates to sky coordinates and I use astrometry.net and in particular I use the offline version of it so it's very fast and this is also discussed in more detail in the user manual but uh, one thing I point out is we only have to solve the first image uh, since we have aligned the images or they will be aligned uh, prior to this step. Okay so let's go ahead and get started here so I'm going to click start and um, as you can see, we're already aligning the, the images. So PixInsight has been invoked and it is now finished. And uh, now we are plate solving. And as you can see, the output, uh, we have generated a new directory. So it does not uh, manipulate your original images. It simply provides a new folder of the processed result here. So. Uh, again, we have this uh, 29 images, and so we're good to go, but uh, let's go ahead and view the images just to see what we're looking at. So, um, yeah, as you might see, okay, maybe is that really flat or not? Well, it actually quite it, it is, for sure, uh, in comparison to the original. So, um, the, the original, for example, if I clear and then add the the original raw frames, you can see that the original images looked like this. So uh, definitely not flat at all uh, with very high amplitude as you go out away from the center, so to speak. Um, so yes, uh, this is good and we are now ready to move on with detecting the asteroid. So. Uh, again, a few ways to do this. So um, I'm going to show first 
a, a very nice convenient approach is you can download observations of the object in question. So this is 2019 CS and if, if I click OK you'll note that it comes back with these observations. So in this demonstration I'm going to pretend like we are the uh, station that originally acquired these images. So they were originally acquired by V01 and if you'll note that was up here. So to make it as though we were station V01, I'm going to delete all the observations um, at its point and onward. So it would have only have had access to these originally. So now this function here, we can attach ephemeris, if you will, of the object to the data set. And what I'm doing here essentially is invoking a third party program called findorb, which is able to take a set of observations and then compute an orbit. So uh, this has been modified slightly, so it is able to return ephemeris. And as you can see, uh, these columns have now been populated. So for each image, we know whether or not the object was in the field of view. Uh, we also know the speed and position angle of the object as it was in each image. Now, I have to issue a bit of caution here. If this is a very new object where its orbit is certainly unknown, then you have to uh, be a bit weary of using speed and position angle from here too strictly. In other words, it might would say 3.94 but you might have to do plus or minus 0 0.2, 0 0.5, something along those lines. Um, and that's where Tycho is, uh, in my opinion, well, uh, an improvement over other programs where you might have to know the speed and position angle too, uh, uh, too precisely. Tycho allows you to um, have uh, lower and upper bounds on these parameters so even if the motion is not very well known, you can still identify the object. It can still track it. So I'll go into that in more detail in a bit, but for now, let's go ahead and do approach number one, if you will. So the first way to detect the object is simply to use the ephemeris information. And so I've created the stack here based on that speed and position angle. And there you can see that was the object. So the stars become streaks whereas the object itself looks uh, motionless so, so as it is here. Um, so yeah, we could then create a track uh, derived from that. And um, what this does essentially is we can, for example, if we wanted to, we could follow the object. So I could do that. Um, but of course, the whole purpose of this is to create observations or measurements of the object. So we would want to load up, first of all, a star catalog, which again assists in mapping pixel coordinates to sky coordinates using reference stars. So a star catalog, for example, can be um, accessed either online <coughs> or using an offline catalog. So I like to use the Gaia DO2 catalog because it's very quick and uh, uh, Gaia DO2 is very um, precise. Um, so anyhow, let's go ahead and load up the catalog and uh, create our measurements. So to do that, we'll do verify track. And so verify simply creates an animation and allows you to help uh, understand whether or not this is a true detection. And it is. So we'll go ahead and create observations. 2019 CS is the object. And as you can see here are the observations. So the first observation here, uh, I can zoom in on that, you see it, and the second, and now the third. So the question at this point might be, you know, are these observations any good? And so we can right click and view with existing observations. So these are the new observations. So for comparison's sake, I'm going to actually delete them. And we'll first all determine if the determine what the original observations look like in terms of measurements. Um, so it looks like 0.59 of these uh, six here. Uh, 0.59 is the highest residual. And with the new observations, the maximum residual oops, is, um, let's take 
to look and see. Point five three. So we went from point five nine to point five three, and so that is a slight improvement. So in other words, these are good residuals and, and good measurements. Um, and so, okay, that's the first way that you might perform follow-up. The other is, okay, maybe you didn't have ephemeris information, but maybe you wanted to create a custom stack. Okay, that's fine. So you can specify your own speed and position angle. And so, as, you, as you'll notice, uh, 3.9 for speed and 73 for position angle is pretty close to um, what the uh, uh, object is. Let me just go ahead and hide that here for a moment. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so 3.973. So I've created a stack with those with that particular motion, and if I adjust it, 3.7, for example, then you'll notice we start to get a bit of a, bit of a streak. Um, 3.5 makes even more of a streak, and so forth. So anyway, yeah, you could create your own custom stack if you wanted to type in your own speed and position angle here. In fact, there's even a way to uh, create the stack with a, a different start and stop. So maybe I want 4.5 for the stop speed or something. Or if we get crazy with the position angle, then you'll notice that the, uh, yeah, definitely looks interesting there. Um, so you can create sort of a curve, um, but no one is really going to do that. Um, this is kind of a, an extra feature. But in any case, those are two ways, if you already know the motion, that you can detect the object. Now, if you don't already know the motion, then you run what's called a synthetic tracker. So if I run the synthetic tracker, then the first step is to identify a threshold for which these stationary objects, the stars, are masked out. Uh, so we, uh, for example, if I didn't know what threshold to use, and I always use it anyway, is auto threshold. So I click auto threshold, and it identifies an optimal threshold, of, again, 99.9% .9 of the time is optimal. Um, so I click OK, and next step then is sensitivity threshold. So 5000 is the ADU level, the background ADU level. And so 10 is fairly sensitive. Um, you, you'll, as you play with this more, you'll understand exactly what's good for you. But uh, if you have a known object, uh, 10 almost always works if you calibrate it in the same way I did. Um, so yeah, 10 is pretty good. And so I'm going to click OK. And uh, on this last step here, I promise it's the last step. <laughs> is then where we define the actual motion vectors to use. So for example, if I clear these out, these are limits for speed and position angle. So if we did not know the motion at all, a completely unknown object, in this case, we would have 35,000 motion vectors to go through, which is not impractically huge, but it's, it's a decent number. And so it might take you 20, minutes or so, maybe not that long, but uh, to process the data if, it, if, if you were to leave these unchecked. But since we do know the motion to some degree, then we can go ahead and check these boxes, or we can actually use data set ephemeris. So again, since we have populated these columns here, we can import that and it will automatically specify the lower and upper bounds for speed and position angle. Now again, as I mentioned before, if it is a very new object, one that has very few observations on it, then you cannot trust the ephemeris too much. So you might have to widen these parameters some. So speed, for example, you might say, well, rather than 3.74, maybe 3. And maybe rather than 4.14, maybe 4.4. In any case, you would widen the search space up a bit. But since we already had some observations available for station V01, the orbit is already fairly well known, uh, at least to the point where 
we're confident we can use these. And so, yeah, let's go ahead and just click OK. And uh, as you can see, that worked out quite well. So it found the object as track number one. And so as before, we can verify the track. And that simply creates the animation here. Again, so this is 2019 CS, and we want to know whether or not these observations are any good. And so we can delete the original and compare with these new observations. So it looks like 0.51 is the max residual. And so again, we had 0.59 and then 0.53 and now 0.51. Again, lower is better. So these are very good observations very good measurements. And so I have now shown how to uh, detect the object in three different ways. And so hopefully that provides some understanding and some uh, introduction on how to use the software. And um, there are certainly a lot more uh, um, details about it, but uh, that's a good starting point. So user manual has some additional information as well. So thanks for watching and see you next time.